Hi, welcome to worship this Sunday, May 15th. I am Pastor Laura, the pastor for Mount Zion and for Scottsville. And it is a joy to be able to worship with you today. I invite you as we begin worship to maybe just even pause the video for a moment. Take a moment to breathe, to center ourselves, to ready our hearts and our minds for God speaking to us today. I invite you to bring your Bibles closer, to light a candle like we have done, signifying how Christ is present here in our midst as we worship. And let us begin with our opening prayer. Let's pray. Glorious God, we give you our complete adoration. Your marvelous love planned the way of salvation. Tender God, we kneel and ask for pardon. Your gracious forgiveness restores our souls. Triumphant God, we proclaim your praise. Your victorious power defeats death and gives life eternal. Thanks be to God. Amen. And let's join together and sing our opening hymn, Christ is Alive. First scripture reading, this is from the book of Psalms, Psalm 116. Let's listen for the word of God. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold upon me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O oh my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. 
I am your servant, the child of your serving maid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thankful sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. During May, we are spending a few weeks in the book of Acts, which is a book that tells the story of the early church and how they faithfully followed God, how they spread the good news of Christ's saving grace, and how they formed community. One of the themes of Acts that we see repeatedly in stories is also one of the Easter themes that we have explored this year, how God can show up in unexpected ways. We saw this in the Easter story of Jesus appearing to the disciples and to Thomas, and we saw it last week in the story of Saul slash Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus. Now we're going to see it again in our main scripture text for today. In this story, we have left Saul slash Paul for the moment, and the text focuses instead on Peter. Essentially, the first half of the book of Acts focuses more on Peter and his ministry, and the second half focuses more on Saul slash Paul and his ministry. So let's see what today's story is. This is a reading from Acts chapter 9, verses 36 through 43. Listen for the word of God. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, Please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. The word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. So where do we see God appear in this story? Well, we actually get to see God in multiple places. First, we see God appear in the life of Tabitha. I love that she is named a disciple. One commentary noted that she is the only woman explicitly named as a disciple in the New Testament. We don't know how she became a disciple. We don't know if she had an encounter with Jesus during his ministry or if she's only heard about him secondhand. We only know that she is a disciple and she is doing what Jesus taught. She is producing the fruit of her faith and she is devoted to this fruit, to the good works and charity that she provides to the widows of Joppa. From the actions of the widows and the disciples in Joppa, we know that she must have been well-loved and respected and perhaps even a leader of some sort in her community. And if her body was laid out in her own home, then she must have had some financial means since the home had an upper room. And we can presume that if this was her home, that she had opened it to the widows and to the disciples, to the community of believers there. We also can guess that she was a great seamstress since the widows were showing off the clothes that she had made for them. In other words, Tabitha used her talents and her resources to produce fruit for God 
to live out her actions, her faithful discipleship. We see how God appeared to other people through the life and the work of Tabitha. We also see God appear in the ministry of Peter. While Jesus was alive, Peter and the other disciples struggled to perform miracles, to, to heal. They struggled to do the work Jesus told them to do. During Holy Week, that last week of Jesus' life, we see that Peter really messed up by denying Jesus and by letting fear take control of his actions. But in the book of Acts, we see Peter now empowered by the Holy Spirit move from fear to trust in God, trust that causes him to act. He is now preaching and teaching about Jesus. He's healing people. And in this story, we see a culmination of the power of God at work in him. And this is important for later events in the book of Acts, which we'll discuss next week. But suffice it to say for today, we see God leading Peter and empowering him. We see a man who has fully moved from fear to trust. We then see God appear in the midst of the mourning community. God appears to them through Peter and in the miracle of the restoration of life. This community reminds me of the women after the crucifixion. They are being faithful to their loved one, even after death. They are doing what they can to honor the life of Tabitha. And in the midst of their rituals of death, God appears. I also am reminded of how God appears in the midst of our grief. When we mourn, God is with us. Finally, we see God show up in the larger area of Joppa. After Tabitha is restored to life, people in the Joppa region turn to belief in God. We see them making the shift to trusting in God and believing and acting on the good news of God's love and grace and the hope of life we have in Christ. Now, I do want to take a quick side trip and discuss one question that was on my mind as I worked on this sermon. Why Tabitha? Why was Tabitha raised from the dead? And honestly, the quick answer is we don't know. But let's explore it for a minute. So first we should remember that this miracle is different from Jesus's resurrection that we celebrate on Easter. Tabitha will die again at some later point. She isn't still alive today. Jesus, on the other hand, is still alive. His resurrection is resurrection to eternal life. And second, we know that Peter and the other disciples encountered a lot of death and grief during the course of their ministries, and yet it was extremely rare that someone was raised from the dead, like Tabitha. Why? We ultimately don't know. Tabitha does have compelling circumstances in her story, but other people would have had compelling circumstances too. So I don't want us to think that Tabitha was raised because she was better than anyone else alive at the time, or that the widows and the men who grieved her death were more faithful than any other mourners. Yes, Tabitha was an incredible woman, and the mourners did have great faith, but we know other incredible people who die and who aren't raised back to life. We know other very faithful mourners whose loved ones remain dead. Sometimes miraculous events like this occur, but they are the exception and not the norm. We don't know why healing that results in life on this earth happens for some people and why healing that results in death happens for others. And if a miracle doesn't occur, it does not mean that we aren't faithful people or that our mourners don't have enough faith. 
I actually hesitated to preach on this text for today because of this point. I've heard bad theology, bad ideas about God, harmful ideas about God because we miss this point. So please hear it again. If a miracle does not occur, it does not mean that we aren't faithful people. So with that being said, let's go back to the story. In the work of Tabitha, we are reminded of what Jesus teaches and what we read about in the book of James. How our faith can't just be in our heads, but it also needs to be in our actions so that others can see God appearing. We can see God appear in the work we do for others, in the fruit that we produce, in the communities we create as we share resources with others. My family has seen this in our neighborhood here in Scottsville. We are creating community among those of us who live on our street, and it started because we started sharing our resources with each other. A chainsaw, a cup of half and half, a bag of apples, some pizza, some knowledge about the area. And in these interactions, even though they aren't explicitly Christian, I know God is in the midst of our kindness and our care for one another. We see God appear in the ministries we engage in. Of course, this is always the hope that God is in the work we do as a church. But it is a good reminder for us when we are faithful to God's call, God shows up. So whatever ministry work we do, we look around and we should see God. I mean, I've seen God in our blast children's events when kids who have never come to our church have gotten a taste of the love of God through the love of adults in our churches who are hiding Easter eggs or setting up an obstacle course or showing them some goats or telling them the story of the shepherds. We see God in rituals and expressions of our faith like worship and funerals. In the traditional words that we say that have been said in some cases for centuries, we hear the voice of God speaking to us, reminding us of God's past faithfulness and assuring us of God's future faithfulness and love for us. We see God in our grief and difficult times. We know God shows up in those times when life is hard when we mourn. I bet that most of us have experienced God's comforting presence with us after a loved one has died, giving us the strength we need to take the next step, to get through the next day, to focus on whatever task needs our attention, and also simply being with us as we cry and as we remember the times we spent with our loved one. We see God in the stories that we tell of God's work restoring us to new life in Christ. The larger community of Joppa would not have known what happened to Tabitha if the witnesses had not gone out and spread the news. They would not have turned, or they wouldn't have known to turn to God if they had not been told that it was God who did this wonderful thing. We too can help others see God when we tell our stories of God. In fact, these stories that we share can be one of the most important ways that we evangelize, that we share the good news of Christ. For example, I can share how God stood by me, giving me strength and gradually enabling me to see a future, to have hope, restoring me to life after one really difficult semester I had in college. So how do we see God in our midst? And I know we've talked a lot over the last couple of weeks about how we can see God in unexpected places. And it may seem like I'm really hammering this point home. But I'm doing that because it is important. It is important for us to be able to see God at work in our lives and around us. So we need to be aware of the many ways 
that God appears, that God can be revealed to us. After all, as I said, our stories about God's presence restoring us to life, forming us into community, strengthening us and prompting us, these are the stories we can tell to proclaim that Christ is alive, that God loves us, that the good news is still alive and applicable today, 2,000 years later. So thanks be to God for all of the ways we see Christ in our midst. Alleluia. Amen. I just want to remind you um, that we are having a couple of Bible studies coming up at the end of the month. And if you can join us, please join us in person. We're going to look at the Apostle Paul using Adam Hamilton's study, The Call. And um, if you're able or interested in doing something online with this, please let me know, and I would love to be able to lead an online study of this as well. And then at the end of the month, May 29th, is the homecoming celebration for Mount Zion. So if you can be in the area, please come and worship with us at Mount Zion at 11 a.m. And note that Scottsville will not have in-person worship. We're all going to join together as siblings in Christ and worship over at Mount Zion we will still have our online worship service available too. And now we take a moment to pray to God, holding before God the joys and the concerns that we have. I invite you to share some of those in the comment section so that we can be praying for one another. But let us take this time now to turn to our Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Holy Lord, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for lifting us and sustaining us, for being there when we call on you. We give you thanks for the joys of this week, for where we have seen you, where we have experienced your love, where you have revealed yourself to us where we have been confident that you are in our midst. Hear now the concerns that we carry with us. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and injured. We continue to remember those who are undergoing treatments, who are recovering from surgeries or anticipating surgery. Lord, we pray for healing, that you strengthen those who are feeling weak, help them to persevere in the rehab and the therapy, whatever it is they're undergoing for their healing. We pray for those who mourn. Comfort them in their grief. Hold them as they question and wonder why. Simply be with them and let them know they are not alone as they mourn. We pray for those who are struggling with mental health issues, Lord, that your light and love can break through the fog of despair or depression or whatever it is that's going on inside them and that you can lead them to the help that they need. Help those of us who love them to know how to respond, to support them, and to love them. And God, we pray, we pray for so many needs that we have seen around us. There are many in our nation dealing with wildfires or the effects of storms those who are dealing with the effects of accidents and violence and in the midst of all of the pain and suffering, enter into their lives and bring your hope and your peace and comfort. We pray for those around the world who are dealing with violence, who are living in the midst of threats and 
We continue to pray for Ukraine. We pray for those in Afghanistan. We pray for peace in Israel and Palestine. Lord, we know this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to places of unrest and violence. And again, we lift our voices for peace and that we, your church universal, can be instruments of peace and can be peacemakers in our world. And Lord, help us as your church, as your people, as Scottsville and Mount Zion to go and to make disciples, to show your love, to help transform lives in our communities into that foretaste of your kingdom. And now we pause for a moment and we hold before you any unspoken concerns in our hearts and we also take a moment to listen for your voice. We pray this all in your Son's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power and the glory forever. Amen. And let us take a moment to give thanks to God for all of the gifts that we have received to sustain the ministries and the work of our churches. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the generosity of your people, for the gifts that we have received that allow us to continue to do your will. Bless these gifts, bless us so that we continue to do that work, that kingdom work, that transforming work, and help to reveal how you are in the midst of our community. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's join together and sing our hymn of praise, the doxology. our closing hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See. Oh. 
receive the benediction. Lord, send us forth this week with eyes and hearts and minds open to see you, with lips ready to share our stories of how you have revealed yourself to us so that we can go and continue to proclaim that Christ is alive indeed. We go now in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.